Zeit. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Ross Patterson Revolution. Brought to you by BlackRifleCoffee.com. Quentin Crawford, welcome to Wilmington, North Carolina. How are you, buddy? Buddy, I'm great, man. How are you? Uh, I'm well. Uh, I thought I thought we'd start with a uh, little captain's hat here from Wilmington Brewing Company. Yeah, a little local, a little local beer. Delicious. How's your summer been? You been up to anything? No, no, I haven't been up to anything. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I, I also I haven't turned on my phone, so I haven't been able to read any news or anything. So what's been going on? Nah, not nothing as far as I've seen. Hmm. So I think yeah. you're I think you're safe. Um. You know what's <laughs> weird though is no one's called me to go back to work. I don't know if they've started. I don't, I don't know if they started shooting. They, I can't imagine them making a TV show without me. <laughs> It's, that'd be kind of like when they killed Optimus Prime in the cartoon movie in the 80s. Remember when we went to go? That was so crazy. It's like, wait a minute. You can't kill Optimus Prime within the first 30 minutes. What are we going to watch for the next hour? I was devastated as a child. So that can't be true. But Whew. it is. Boss. It Boss. Is, uh, it has been a weird, weird summer, man. I First of all, I was with you. Um and hours, hours before this, this all, this all shook out. We, you had called me and you said, "Hey, man, I'm I'm hosting a a charity for veterans. That's you're super passionate about your charity work, um, and uh, and that's what I find hilarious." And I was like, "Yeah." And when I got there, you were like, "Hey, man, so I haven't gotten a call to go back for the next season." And he's like, uh, you, "You you were like, what what do you think's happening?" And I was like, I, "I don't know. Maybe they're recasting." Well, I think at that point, the first article had come out, right? They'd come yes. out and said that it was bad behavior, yeah. and I was just and and I I personally thought, oh well, I have a pretty good idea where this where this the source of this information is coming from, and it'll surely just blow over at someone just being a little bit of a jerk, and it it came out perfectly on the day that I directed my first episode of national television, <laughs> <laughs> not to not to distract from this beautiful proud moment, and I think it was about four days after my birthday, my fortieth birthday. So, ah, there it is, happy birthday! Uh, but it has been a uh, it's it's been a, a tumultuous fortieth. Uh, it's been interesting and growing. Look, man, that article came out, and I was like, ah, okay, well, this is going to blow over, and uh, yeah. and then it didn't. And I, and I think so. I was asked you. I said, "What in the fuck do you think is going on? What do you think they're doing?" Yeah. And I told you, I was like, "Man, if you haven't heard at this point, because you're so close to upfronts, and the show is doing well, mm-hmm. especially overseas, it's crushing overseas." And let's face it. Oh yeah. If 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 a TV show is doing well overseas, it's making a lot of money. Yeah. And I I, I thought for sure I was like, ah, they couldn't be dumb enough to fire the lead. Like, are they going to fire Riggs and, re- and replace Riggs? Has it happened in the past in TV shows? Yes. Has it been successful? It's a little different when you replace Becky or the mom off of Fresh Prince. Right. 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 Like, it's a little... (laughs) Like, if they'd replaced the Fresh Prince, (laughs) we'd have been like, what the fuck are we watching anymore? Yeah. So that's why I just didn't think he was possible. And again, I knew we had problems. Um, You know, because obviously, we saw the show differently. I think I came from it creatively. You know, I just finished Rectify. So... I was quite hesitant to come into uh, a network show, much less uh, the remake of of what I thought was a great film um, and a great franchise, uh, with excluding the fourth film. And you know, so again, we our, our work ethics were quite different, and and creatively, we saw the show much differently. But I just didn't think they were going to get rid of me, I, I guess. And and if they did, I thought they would give me a buzz. And just say, hey. A jangle. Just a jangle. You know, yeah. just grab two cans and a string and just be like, you're not coming back. <laughs> we feel like this is the Damon Wayans show and uh, people just don't like you. <laughs> um, so go the fuck back to Alabama, you dumb hick. Uh, <laughs> thanks for playing. So for the record, you never got a call from Warner Brothers saying, hey, you're fired, right? <clears throat> no. What, what happened was when the first. To this day. Uh, to this day, it makes my back hurt thinking about it. Oh, God. Oh, God. By the um, way, your Instagram posts during the season finale when this all shook out of like, 
Hey guys, did, nobody's called. I, I laughed for a thousand years. Here, here's the greatest thing. My buddy, that pose was when I was, you know, doing some dumb shit, diving in the water down in Los Angeles, uh, at Long Beach Pier, and shooting some scene, right? And and I get out of the water, you know, like, and and one of the. Um, uh, dolly operators sent me that pic and he's just like and we would always send it back and forth to each other and it's like when you walk in at three o'clock and your wife wants to know where you've been you know yeah. so we'd always just put different different things and i was like yeah well this is the perfect opportunity to use that picture you can't be firing <laughs> me because that would be ridiculous <laughs> which i don't think they thought was funny uh but i'm glad you did look the article came out he did no, so, so here's the thing because I had just left your house a couple hours earlier and flown back uh, to here. And so E had posted your Instagram post and I saw it on Twitter and I was like, wait, what? And that's where I found out because I didn't find out from you. I didn't find out from, you know, anyone. There was no official press release. And I was like, hang on. E's got your Instagram up. And that's when I text you. I was like, yo, man, have you heard anything that you're fine? You're like, no, but everybody else is. And I was in Nashville because you had left town. We did the benefit. And then Kane wanted me to come up because he just bought yeah, that new restaurant yeah. up in Nashville. Christian Kane. Yeah, Christian Kane. We all love him. Uh, so, so the wife and I drive up to uh, to Nashville, and we take a nice road trip, listening to you know podcasts. So when I get to when I get to Nashville, I just got a shit storm of texts because I guess the other Ooh. article came out that said you're being replaced, like he's being fired. And and uh, and I was just I, I looked at the wife, and I'm like, what the fuck? We're getting ready to go to dinner, and I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna post this pic, click, throw the phone to the side because you know me, yeah, 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 and my cell phones, like I rarely have it on me. And that is true, by the way, for, for the audience and everybody at home. Getting a hold of you is is like trying to get a hold of Trump. Like you, you just don't have a fucking phone with you because you live your life in the moment. You you're a very in the moment guy, and like, hey, you'd rather spend time with your family or whatever. You're not on social media all the time. I don't like talking on the tel- telephone, and, no. and, and 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 I feel like too much gets lost in texting. So for me, I just fucking hate the device. Um, so yeah, it, it was it was quite unusual, you know, to to again turn on the phone once we landed in Nashville. Um, and, and I, I said we were driving. Um, so when we got there and to see all these all these texts. And so then, of course, I go and check social media because that's how I found out my fate is God. either through social media or through uh, Deadline, which is obviously swinging from the sack of Warner Brothers. Right. And, um, and, and Deadline is the go to insider site for Hollywood. It's not even like a traditional uh, site as far as like normal audience goers for TV or movies. That's mm-hmm. an insider site f- for us, and so that that's where I caught the story was on Deadline. But, um, but I used the, to look the amazing at Deadline. Thing to me, is we hear this all the time. You hear this all the time in the world of like, man, I found out like NFL players. I found out I was traded on Twitter. I found out the coaches. I found out I was fired on Twitter. You really did. So that's real. I found out everything. Through social media or um, again Deadwood uh, Deadline <laughs> Deadline, yeah. um, and, and when I found out that Sean had actually uh, been hired, that was Mother's Day uh, that Sunday, and we're all sitting at the dinner table, and everybody's phones just kind of start lighting up, and um, my mom actually showed me the picture, Sean William Scott. And she yeah. said, she goes, they, they actually did it, you know? Um, so to go back to your previous question, when the first article came out, I called Mick G first. And I was like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. I was like, this is not, this is obviously Damon putting this shit out there. Like, this is, nothing's going to really happen with this, right? And he directed the pilot, correct? He directed the pilot and he directed the second episode. Gotcha. Uh, Mick G is why I signed on to this deal. You know, um, he, he he's a, he's a great dude and he's he's really uh, energetic and he and he has a great vision. He's he's a little bit of a cowboy. Um, so when the first article came out, I, I called Mick G and he's just like, "This is crazy. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it." And then he goes, "Let me call Warner Brothers." And then he called me back. He's like, "It's not good." I go, "What do you mean it's not good? What's not good?" He goes, "Dude, you need to call Peter." So I called Peter Roth and um, and. He and this was, I think, that Monday night. And I said, "Look, man, what the hell's going on? How?" Are we? And I started to approach it. How are you going to let this guy put this slander shit out there? And the first thing he said to me was just like, "Clay, Clay, Clay, stop, stop, stop." He said, "Clay, I can't promise you that I can save your job, but what I can tell you is that you have to make a public announcement, apologizing publicly, right, to Damon Wayans." And I was like, what the, I was like, Peter, why would I apologize publicly? Because he and I had a riff on set. And he's like, Clay, that statement alone tells me that you don't want to come back. You're kidding. He goes, and I, and I, I had my wife, I had us us on speakerphone. My family was in the home, was in my house. Uh, My parents were there. 
Um, he said, you know, Clay, if I were you, I'd look your children in the eyes and I'd look your wife in the eyes and you need to make a decision. He goes, but again, I can't promise you that I can save your job. And we hung up and I looked at my family and I was just like, I can't apologize to this guy. Like he has made life miserable for me on this show. And I was like, and I also feel like that they're already moving forward. I feel like if I apologize, they're going to use that to justify this poor decision that they're making and supporting his bad behavior ah. and his ego. So I knew that they had these tapes because they had been blackmailing me with the tape um, of me yelling at Newman since October of 2017. And who is Newman for the audience, by the Newman way? Newman was the first AD. Okay. <clears throat> and for anyone who's not familiar with the, the industry, it's the assistant director, but essentially their job is to kind of wrangle the cast, get everyone where they need to be, whether it's the actors, whether it's the crew, getting everything quiet. They're the ones that say, guys, we're rolling. You know, they, and a lot of times they're the ones that actually call action mm. um, because sometimes Video Village, which is where the director kind of views what's happening through the, through the camera. It's so far away. It's so far away. Uh, and, and we had two different ADs when they would rotate uh, each episode. So they would, one would be prepping while the other one was shooting and vice versa. So they would kind of rotate. So I knew that they had those tapes and they had been blackmailing me with that. And when I say blackmail, anytime I had a problem with D, whether it be um, he would show up to work and say, Damon Wayans. Right. And he would say, Damon would say, you know, what are we doing at this church? I was like, what do you mean we're doing at this church? Like we're shooting here all day. And he's like, and he would take his material and go, I can't shoot inside of a church. It's against my religion. I started dying laughing because I thought it was funny. Right. And he's like, dude, I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I'm not allowed to go into another house of worship. And it's like, well, then fucking read the script beforehand because he wouldn't do table reads. So there was no way for us to get an indication of what worked and what didn't work and what he would do and what he wouldn't do. So we would have to find out on the day. So he would just say, I'm going home. And they would look at me and go, you got to memorize all his shit. And then I'd be walking around with a stunt double you know, in any of the big wide shots. And then they would build like for that inst- for that episode specifically, we were in a confessional at one point. So they built the confessional on the sound stages at Warner Brothers and we had to shoot it a week later. So wow. this kind of shit would come up all the time, right? And I would go and I would complain. Well, once they had that tape, anytime I complained, it's like, this will come out and it will ruin your career. Now, mind you, when the incident happened, I had to pay half of my salary for that episode, um, I had to go use, I had to spend six weeks in anger management every day on my lunch break. Um, and I had to be escorted to and from set from my trailer to set by a security guard. So it was humiliating. <clears throat> and essentially, what was the incident for the, for the, well, audience? if you ask variety, I were, I was yelling at children, right, which is a, right. Cause that's bla- what I, that's, that's a blatant fucking lie. And that's what I read. And I was like, man, there's no, there's no way I know you. I've, I've known you for 20 years. I've, I've, we've done what four or five movies together, a TV show, <laughs> numerous sketches. Like you would Bottom never line, yell We at know kids. each other as fathers. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. You would never yell at children. Clearly, so I'm yelling at statement. Newman. Yeah. Clearly, I'm yelling at the guy whose job it is to get the set quiet. And here's the thing. Did I make a poor choice? Absolutely. Right? I shouldn't have lost. And I felt embarrassed in the moment because I was belligerent. I was so angry. Right? We'd been shooting a three-page scene for eight hours. Okay? We were so behind. And we continued to try to shoot through all this noise. So we called everyone in production. We stopped production over seven times. I called my agents. We were writing emails. We were calling everyone we could to try to help us resolve the situation. No one would come in. No one would help us, right? Right. So I shot all of my coverage in between the sounds. Now, when we say sounds, you can watch the episode. It's episode five of season two. There's no fucking swimming pool. There's no children anywhere nearby. We were in a park, and it was a Wednesday in the middle of October, right? So everybody's at school. We're in a park, which we'd cleaned out. The sound was coming from this cinder block wall, which you can see in the shot of the episode. And something was happening inside that that was echoing because it it sounded maybe like a gymnasium-type environment. And it sounded like, to us like lockers being slammed kind Mm -hmm. of thing. But whatever it was, 
sound kept looking at me just shaking their head saying it's unusable yeah now in production a lot of times they don't care about sound because they'll say you can just adr it and adr is right to uh, you know to audio, uh, audio um to go record your Additional dialogue voice recording yeah. so it's essentially you go in if there's if there's a flub or if there's an airplane going by you go and you correct that sound so that they can use it in the cut it destroys a performance most of the time. And anyone who cares about creativity wants to get the set quiet. Rare, only in network television do they just, they can care less. This is, it's a sausage factory. So it's really just about pulling the levers. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm okay with that, right? I, I'm not okay with that, but fucking I'd, I'd, I'd come accustomed to, this is how we have to work sometimes. So I'd learned to be able to do my dialogue. I would do one line at a time in between the sounds. And we got mine clear. When this poor kid is sitting there with a gun to his head and he's crying and he's shaking and he's done it fucking a hundred times and the, the boom operator who's standing behind him hanging the microphone over us, she's just looking at me and shaking her head because there's so much racket. Right. I snapped. Should I have walked to my trailer? A hundred percent. Should I have just gone and sat and waited because that's what I was instructed to do when there was a problem. You go sit in your trailer and you lock your door and you take a nap. I come from the independent film world where if you don't pull up your fucking bootstraps and get it done, we don't get the movie made. Yeah. So I just didn't, I, I, I'm from Alabama where I, I come from a very blue collar background. So we just work hard and you get the job done. Now, again, again, Hollywood is very sensitive, so I should not have screamed and yelled, right? Because it's a bunch of very delicate flowers out there. I've said worse. And, and are you fucking kidding me? And we grew up with coaches when we were 12 yeah. years old that were yelling. It and, was and a that, tool that, of motivation. You can go on YouTube, anybody at home, and you can watch that scene because they, they did release these tapes, quote unquote, that was uh -huh. like, oh, this is the damning evidence. When I watched these tapes, I watched it and I thought the same thing. If you've worked on a movie set before or, or any TV production, clearly you're screaming at somebody to lock the set down and, and get these people to, sh to shut up. You saying that thing about the, 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 the kid with the gun to his head, that was the scene. A kid was about to commit suicide he's in a in a highly dramatic moment all you want is for this kid whoever the actor was i don't know his name i don't either just to 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 have some peace and quiet get his scene done and get out of there he's crying he's got the gun to the head it's the whole thing and you just, it just seems quiet. so creatively disrespectful to me yes and 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 that was my problem with this director at that time he had directed episode three as well and he could not get the set under control so our biggest issue was when it came to safety because there were so many issues which now you're seeing season three these guys are having tons of issues when it comes to safety because there it's just it's a fucking free-for-all there's there's no leadership um we never had a showrunner on set matt miller was never on set maybe 10 times in 22 episodes and we shot for 200 days um there was no producing director on set because that was Steve Boyum who directed a lot of the episodes and he was in his 70s so he just couldn't be on set every day. So they were living they were kind of giving it up to the director. And why do you think they were doing that is my question because it is highly unusual one to let your lead actor not do table reads at all. Uh, even if they phone it in, because I've seen that before where it's like great, put him on a conference call, he can read it from his fucking bedroom or whatever. And that's you want. fine. It's fine. Let's just hear it. Exactly. Let's just hear it out loud. So they usually let do that and not having, uh, you know, a strong, strong showrunner on set with you is crazy unusual. For I've a big never TV experienced show. it. I've never, you know, on Rectify, which was a very small television show, but AMC does everything right, you know, and, and Sundance was under the AMC IFC umbrella. And we had, first of all, Ray McKinnon was on set every single day with the director, with a producer, with the producing director. Every scene, no one missed. So for me, I felt like I had to because D let us know from the very first episode or the second episode because in the pilot he was in pretty decent spirits. But by the second episode, he's like, I don't want to be here. This is not what I signed up for. I'm done. He checked out. So Damon Wayans. Correct. Yeah, and yeah. for me, I thought that I was going to be able to kind of sit behind this a legend who had been doing this forever and I could kind of learn the ropes. That was not the case. He shut down. I've got, I'm, I'm looking at buses going by fucking Hollywood in Hollywood with my picture on the side of it. And I'm like, if this thing sucks, I'm fucked. Yeah. So I kind of took the reins. Okay. And I kind of started running set. I started making rewrites. I started working with the directors and I started working with the actors and I started doing everything I could regarding quality control. Um, so no one's on set. It, it's, it's haywire and I lose my shit. Um, 
and I got fucking reamed for it and I had to pay financially and I had to pay with my time and uh, humility, um, again, being escorted to and from set. So I knew that they were going to release these tapes because they've been blackmailing me with them uh, for months and months and months, the entire second season. So I knew after Peter told me that I had to apologize to Damon, I was like, well, I've got to address this head on because right now I sound like, and I, and I knew why they did, they, they said that I, was mis- I mistreated my cast and crew. They knew how important my cast and crew was to me. I said multiple times that this is the best crew I've ever worked with. Um, and I'm not famous by any means, but I've worked on hundreds of, of sets. Right. And these guys were just dialed in. And it was because they, no one thought the show was going to go, right? Because so many remakes had been, can't, had been tanking. And I think... Um, it's, the, look, it's, it, it's tough, man. Especially Lethal Weapon. You're, you're coming... I mean, it's so famous. You're coming in to play Mel Gibson's character, for Christ's sakes. Like... And that was a big shadow. Even as your buddy, I I I was like, "There's no fucking way this gets past the pilot. There's no way unless they actually let you do what you want to do and and who you are, which is miraculously what happens." Um, But Ross, that's the only because I passed on this thing five times. So every time I would say I'm going to have a mustache, they're like, "No, you're not." I'm like, "Well, then I'm not doing it." Fuck. Well, I'm going to have long hair. No, you're not. Well, then I'm not doing. So every time I would just say I'm going home. And Mick G to his credit, was extremely supportive of my process. I mean, we'll, we'll get into that whole thing. But so basically, I knew I had to apologize. Um, I knew I had to make a statement and put something out there. And, and I didn't know if possibly there was somebody that I'd offended. You know, but the first call I made was Kevin Rahm, and, who played Captain, Captain Avery. And then I called uh, Keisha Sharp. And Jordana, and I was just like, am I missing something? Do I, am I living in a bubble and I don't really understand, like, is my ego or am I, am I a fucking lunatic? Have, right. I, have I been hurting people? And I, and I have all the text messages from these people and voicemails from these people saying, obviously you're not the problem, but you've got to get ahead of this because you know, they're going to use those tapes against you. So I, I've sat down and I tried to write the best, you know, kind of little statement that I could. And I had the help of a friend of mine, uh, Jen Nicolaisen, and, and we, um, we put this thing together and, and I released it. And, um, and the next thing I know, you know, like I say, I, I, I get fired. So it's, uh, um, yeah. Let me ask you this, going back to those tapes, cause the second one that got released was a conversation with you and Damon. Uh, Mm-hmm. Where you were uh, going back and forth, I mean, literally right up until an action take, mm-hmm. where uh, you called him a pussy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did not know about that tape. I was not aware of that tape. So you didn't know about that tape. I didn't. Okay. I didn't know. I didn't know that they look. They had had this. The tape of me yelling at Newman. Everybody in production had on their cell phones, mm-hmm. right? So that was a little frustrating. That Why? Like, because it's any time I said well, something, they the would thing, play it. it. It's rare you're on a <clears> set. <throat> And somebody allows you to take cell phone videos. It's of- not cell phone video, Ross. It was the actual footage. They had the actual audio from production. A why, file. Are they, why are they keeping that is my question. Again, there was... There, I, look, it's I, so I'm not a conspiracy ba- it's, guy. It's, it's, it's so backhanded <laughs> and it's so crazy to me that it's like if you're an actor out there, first of all, you're mic'd up all day long. All day long. All day long. But God I was under the impression. you said on a phone call or any, anywhere else that they've recorded and put out. I thought it was illegal, though, for them to be able to. I didn't think they could put something out like this. And I kept saying, what, are you going to put it out? You're not going to put this fucking tape out of me. Right. Right. And, and, but, yeah, they had it on their phones, man. And uh, it was kind of going around. So It happened to Christian Bale, too. Bruce. That was also, Bruce. That was also Mick G. Stop. Make G directed that film. Maybe it's his fucking sound editor. (laughs) But wasn't the DP adjusting (laughs) lights or some shit in the middle of the scene? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they were overseas. And when you're overseas, it's all bets are off, dude. These there's I know just be you'll be in the middle of like a scene, you're like, Kevin, I don't need and then it's like just need to fix this little light. No, no, no. Keep keep pretending it's beautiful. It's beautiful. (laughs) Hey Goro, no the last gift. No. No, shh. They'll fix it in ADR. The fact that that was also a G production is, is really funny, actually. Mm. But the thing that I, I want to say is, like, from an acting standpoint, a director, like, I've produced a ton of shit. Uh, we've done a lot of things together. 
first of all, I've said worse to people. Um, when, mm. when, when a set isn't locked down and people are screaming, or if I see movement behind the camera or whatever, like I lose my shit the exact same way. I, I did not feel that was bad. And especially because of what that young man was going through acting wise. He's got, look, he's got one shot. These guest stars have one shot to make an impression on a network yep. that's going on their reel. It is a massive dramatic scene scene in Lethal Weapon, a huge TV show. But Ross, on top of see. that, they're excited to be there. Yes. They love the show. Yeah. So they think it's going to be great. And then it's a fucking shit storm. Yeah. And, and I was just always trying to protect these guys, you know, that and my crew. Um, the Damon Wayans thing. Now, with that tape. I've had conversations like like that too, and like your back and forth to me wasn't that bad. So when when they leak that tape, and I'm going to use heavy air quotes on on leak that tape, I didn't think it was that bad either. I've, I again, I've said worse to co-stars, and people have said worse to me. Where it was just like, I mean, I've had massively famous people, like A-list, Oscar nominated people, say. Fuck you, dude. Fuck you, Rod. Like on set, where it's just like, and you know what? We don't care. Well, because it's like war. you don't care. You you turn the corner and you're like, great. That's Look, it. nobody gets their feelings shit. hurt in war, yeah. right? And 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 that's because it's you kind of got to fly off the cuff and you're figuring it out. And we're just trying to survive. And that's a lot. Not to compare making fucking movies to, to war. war by any goddamn <laughs> yeah, means, yeah, right? No, no. But let's say it's like sports, which we take very seriously. Right. And there's no fucking life or death in us. And and collegiate athletics, for instance, which you and I just talked about, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of screaming and yelling. A lot. And sometimes it fucking is necessary to get the job done when there's a clock ticking. Not in Hollywood. No. People are very sensitive nowadays. Very sensitive. Right? And here's the thing. Go for it. Go try to make Apocalypse Now where everybody's having a good time and being sweet. Uh, you can't. You, you no, can't. go. Fuck, yeah. Like, go. <laughs> I just want you to go fucking make Shawshank. And everybody have a great time, and it's never difficult yeah. on anyone. Like, give me a fuck. I think that's what like Damon said in an article recently, uh, which is the only reason I'm doing this is because every time, it's August, and any time they talk about the show, it's my image, yep. my fucking name, and to it, promote their goddamn show. And, and it, by the way, every article starts with this. Clayton Crawford was fired for bad behavior, and then they brought in so and so, and now we're giving you this, and it's like they they just keep hammering you over and over yeah. and over again. I think you, they're trying to justify their poor decision. Well, look, this is this is one of the first times I can say in in a long goddamn time where when you got fired because you got fired on the day of the season finale, an hour before, mm -hmm. an hour before the season finale, fans were starting to read about it online because they're going to Twitter just to comment on the episode. It's, I, I think, arguably the, the best episode you guys have done, too, on Lethal Weapon in those two seasons. Quite possible. You were amazing in that, uh, especially when you get shot at the end. It's not a mystery anymore. It's not a spoiler alert. Right. It's not only you're fired, well, but Ross, you're, you're I, I, have, I have died in like 60 different productions, so yeah. I, 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 I'm, I'm quite versed in the, uh, the death <laughs> on screen. But everybody went to Twitter, and then they raged against the machine of like, Dude, you killed off the show. Not just Riggs, but the show. And I'm with the fans on this one, where when I watched this show, to me, you you made the show and I was watching it for you. Uh, not that I dislike Damon Wayans as an actor, by Obviously, the way. yeah. And I appreciate you saying that. That's very sweet. Yes. But but again, not that I dislike Damon Wayans as an actor, because that's not true. I, I, li I like Damon Wayans. He's a legend. You made that show. He was the the guy who was the, you know... He wasn't the jokester, and I think probably that got to him where, look, man, that guy's usually bringing the comedy, whereas every single episode, they were waiting to see what Riggs did. They don't really give a shit what Murtaugh did. Yeah, and that sucked for him. You know, I think that he told me that he never thought this thing was going to go and that he had gone to Peter Roth with another idea to do a show because he said that he was ready to kind of you know, come out of retirement and that he wanted to make a television series. And when he went into Peter, Peter's like, that's a great idea, but let me pitch you something else first. Ah, uh, lethal weapon. <laughs> I'm sure that went over like a fart in church. Like to Damon. a fart in church. And, and apparently, you know, Damon was like, okay, well, they're going to bring in some hick from Alabama that nobody's ever heard of to play rigs. Yeah, I'll go shoot your pilot and then you'll make what I want to make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once we hit full swing, he was just miserable. 
Right. Um, so look, I, I'll, I'll address that second tape and then and then we'll we'll go back. But yeah, I did not expect that tape to come out. Uh, that was the episode I was directing. Uh, I was quite nervous uh, and, and excited. And understand, I only was able to direct an episode of season two because I did not want to come back for season two. It was such a shit show season one. And I felt like I'd been lied to. They told me that Damon was so excited and that, he, you know, Peter gave me a song and dance when I, because I had passed multiple times and they flew me out to LA and I had to sit in a room with him. And Peter starts telling me that Damon had had brain surgery and he had a tumor removed from his uh, pituitary, pituitary gland and um, that he had this whole new outlook on life and that he was Murtaugh, right? And then we get to set and this guy hates it. So I was like, Peter, you sold me, you sold me a bag of oranges and I got home and it was fucking bananas, bro. Like, I don't want this. I don't want to do this every day. So part of them keeping, keeping me excited about the show was saying, okay, you can direct an, an episode next year, which that never happens. I, I've never directed. Ever. That, you, never. That, that's, that's a, a season free, three, maybe. And not only that, but that's a free ticket into the DGA as well, where People work for two years oh, to get into but the DGA. It's huge. It's huge. Usually, again, you've got to have that season three guarantee, and then they're like, "All right, we'll throw you a bone, and we'll, you know." Yeah. Well, they did it for me because I was like, "Look, I'm not coming back and working with this asshole." Right. So, ironically, Damon apologized to me when we were in Paris. Mick G was there. We were there doing a press tour, and Mick G happened to be there uh, before season two. Yes, correct. Yeah. So uh, the summer after season one, okay. we, we were doing this huge press room. We were in, we were in Paris. We were in London. Uh, we were in, in New York. And um, Damon had just said, look, I'm sorry. Because it got rough. At the, if you watch the end of season one, fuckers got on a beanie 90% of the time and just mumbling the words. Like he was, but ironically, him being so pissed off made his work great. Like he played Murtaugh really layered. Yeah. But it was just him being pissed. So they let me direct. Um, and they got me acupuncture on set and they got me a gym and they had me a masseuse and all these things just to try to keep me zen and that I could, so I could do my job. So I was like, okay. And I thought Damon was going to come back in season two and be really excited. He wasn't, he was, it was the same old bullshit. Um, so when I'm directing my episode, which is episode 20, um, Damon's first or second day, I forget he called in sick, which he's never called in sick. Right. Comes back to work the next day and he's shooting hoops. And I was just like, are you, you feeling better? And he's like, come on, bro. Everybody needed a day off. <laughs> when you're getting paid that much money. I mean, you no. Know. You know who I am as a human being. Yeah. Not to get physical in that moment, to think that he costs me a day. Yeah. Which in, to the fans who don't know anything about television, like it is asshole and elbows trying to, we shoot nine, 10 pages a day. We basically shoot a movie in nine days. And it's really fucking difficult. Yeah. Not on, not on the actors as much as it is the crew. Those guys, and they were champions. They showed up every day with a good attitude and trying to make the best quality, best product uh, possible. Because sometimes the directors, because again, it was Lethal Weapon. We get these directors that come in who are just like, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? They yeah. don't know their ass from the elbows because all the good directors are booked out. And nobody wants to come do Lethal Weapon. Um, so Damon's second day, he comes in. Uh, third day, whatever it was, and that's when he got hit with a shrapnel. And uh, it wasn't that he was injured; it's that he continued to say everyone had targeted him. That's when it made a turn, and he started saying that people should be fired. And this is a this is a a, a VX crew, VFX crew that I had been working with for two straight seasons that were just fantastic, and safety was always the number one priority. Um, granted things would get rushed and the directors would get and th safety would become an issue, but only because they would stop listening to Tim Trella, the stunt coordinator and the special effects guys. Um, so when he starts saying that people need to be fired, I got extremely upset and they did an investigation. Damon went home, which cost me my second day of shooting. I had to shoot the stunt double all day. Um, and I was quite upset and I was upset for my crew, but they came back and they said there was no wrongdoing. Uh, Damon said, when he left that day, I'll not hold a gun. You can't point a gun at me. I'm not running. I'm not jumping. I'm not doing stunts anymore because I don't trust you and I don't trust them. So I called uh, Matt Miller. Boy, how do you do a <clears throat> cop show when you don't hold a gun? Hmm. How do you do an action show? Yeah. So I, when I called, the, here's the best part, is when I called fucking the head of Warner Brothers and I go, you've got to help me. He's left the set again that's two days he goes you wanted to direct direct i'll worry about the actors 
That's the only one I did want to direct. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, and then, look, I did Touché, want to yeah. good man. Uh, congratulations. Oh, checkmate. So I was like, all right, fuck. So I started, I went to the old typewriter. Cling, and I was like, all right, I'm going to rewrite the scenes for tomorrow, which was all the scenes where, and this is episode 20. So again, there's like visual facts to support it. So episode 20, uh, when we walk into the optometrist, um, we're all sitting in the car, which is where the audio was played, was he and I sitting in the car. And then we get out of the car and we walk into the optometrist and that's where the gunfight happens and then ends up in the movie theater. I'm like, this fucking guy's not going to do any, because he wasn't, because they felt if they took me out of the most of the action scenes for my episode that I could have more time to direct. And I was like, guys, don't put it on Damon. I can fucking do both. But that's neither here nor there. So they put it, so I was like, okay, I went in that night and I start rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. And I'm like, okay, so I'll come in. Damon can call me. We can have the conversation about Rihanna on the phone. When I'm walking into the optometrist, then I can do this. And then it can cut to, after the theater scene, it can cut to Roger and the kid that stayed in Rihanna in an interrogation. I was like, it'll work perfect. He's like, no. I'm like, Miller, he's not going to act tomorrow. He's like, dude, we're not writing him out of the scenes. I was like, then before we shoot, you and Peter Roth and Mark Albert, we all need to be on set with Damon and have a conversation and find out why he's sabotaging my episode. Like, let's just find out why he's upset and let's get everybody on the same page. I have emails begging Peter Roth to help me. Radio silence. So we get to work. Damon walks up. And the first thing I say to him is, I'm like, hey, how's your boo-boo? Yeah. Puts in his fucking earbuds. I'm like, fuck. Gonna be a long day. Gonna be a long day. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So then I'm like, all right, well, let's go into the optometrist. And they were setting up the shot, which was us in the car, which is what you heard. So they're setting up the shot, which was across the street because I wanted a long uh, raking from the other cor- the opposite corner to cut in between uh, the close-ups of us walking into the optometrist. So they're setting that up, and we decide to rehearse the actual optometrist scene. So we get into the room, and I mean, it's a fucking, every, all the crew members are inside the room, including Matt Miller, which is the first time, him and Mark Albert, both on set, which is the first time that had happened in the entire season one So they two. did read the email, and they came. They came to work okay. to keep us apart from one another, gotcha. right? So I said, D, you're going to be doing this and this. He's like, nope. I was like, well, you look, just, I'll give you a rubber gun. It's not even real. And he's like, nope. I was like, well, dude, I can't frame out the fucking gun. Yeah. I was like, so you got to hold something and just squat down. He's like, I'm not squatting down. I was like, well, bro, you're supposed to run down the stairs and then yeah. you got to run down the hallway and then you got to tackle the dude. He's like, not me. That's Robert. And Robert was his stunt double. I was like, all right, well, you can go and uh, we'll figure everything. He walked off set and I looked at everybody and go, what the fuck are we going to do today? I'm like, guys. And they go, look, you got to figure it out with Robert. And I'm like, I'm not shooting Robert's ass all fucking day. Like people want to see Damon's face. Yeah. Not they, Robert the stunt double. Robert, who's a great guy. Not Hell, that I, I, Robert's not a great guy. Look, I worked with Robert more than I did Damon, okay? He was a <laughs> great fucking dude. So I said, so, I'm, so I go, well, fuck this. I'm going to go talk to him. And they're like, you're not going to talk to him. So we get in the car. They're like, pictures up, ready to go shit the ground. So I'm like, okay, fuck. So we get into the crown big. And I just looked at him like, oh, you're a pussy. I said, I think the first thing out of my mouth was, and they bleeped it out, but I go, I said, you know, Hicksy, which Hicks is my youngest son. He's six. I go, Hicks would have taken that hit better than you did. And what'd he say to that? I think he said, he goes, oh, pff, pff. I go, you're just a pussy. <laughs> And I was so disappointed in him. And everybody's like, dude, you were so calm in that thing. I was like, I just didn't know where else to go. And I'd been putting up with his bullshit for two years where, like, we'd wait half an hour for him to finally get a shot set up. And then we all get to set and Damon Co. I gotta go to the bathroom. And they walk off for 20 fucking minutes. Like, he just sabotaged everything. He just didn't want to be there. Right. But he did it in this very passive aggressive way. And I was just over it. And I was just like, dude. Like, you're only famous because fucking Keenan, bro. Yeah. Like That's when things suck. got heated in that tape. Well, then I think he told me to suck his pussy dick. Yeah. Um, but here's the best part. They didn't sh- share the whole tape. No, they never do, by the way. You they know, gave you, you just that. a nice little yeah. piece because I ripped his ass. I told him that we could bring Steve Harvey in from the Family Feud today. And the audience would embrace it. Shut the fuck up. I told him that we could bring fucking Keenan out of retirement. Shit, we could take Damon Jr., who is a great guy. He's a great actor. He's a, gr- and a, He's great, a great actor. actor. Yeah. <laughs> and a Fox legend. Fox loves Damon, Damon uh, Wayans Jr. 
<laughs> and apparently Sean William Scott was, was, was Damon Jr.'s really good buddy. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I ripped his ass. But Ross, it was because I just had had enough. And I told my wife, because she's, she's like, why did you do it? And I was like, because fuck, man. I, I, had to, I, just, I had to tell him what I thought of him. And that he's a waste of space. And that nobody cares, man. Like you are, we call Damon Lee, lazy, entitled elitist. And that was just it, man. And he that was, was his just, nickname on set? That was his nickname on set, you know. And it was just because he just, he, it, it, he just, and again, he didn't want to be there. Right. And maybe he got, and I, and I don't want to bash, I know I am bashing the dude, but, but it, maybe, he, you know, maybe they sold him a bag of goods like they sold me. And that it was, dude, this show's going to be my wife and kids with guns. Right. Right. You're going to be Murtaugh. We're going to take this and really fuck rags. This is going to be about Murtaugh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and the Murtaugh family. Maybe that's what they sold him. I don't know. They probably told you guys both the same thing, if you want to be honest about it. Of like, hey, this is Riggs' show. This is going to be your ship. You're the captain of it. And they pulled him aside and said, Murtaugh, oh, God, you probably saw the movie where it was all Riggs. Congratulations. It is not that. It is going to be the Murtaugh show. No way is it going to be no, that. No, sir, is it going to be fuck that. Fuck that white dude. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing, though, that I find out of all of this, I, I, even all the controversy, all the you guys hate each other, all this other shit that's going on. Which I don't hate him, by the way. I do not blame I know you him. Don't. I don't blame him. I honestly blame the leadership and that actors and artists are fucking lunatics. And that's why they build sound stages and they put us all on it because it's a circus and you got to keep it under the tent. The leadership failed us on this show. And, and, and the fact that there's no investigation about what really went on, and I would imagine if this thing fails miserably, which I don't want, I'm not saying that I want it to fail. And look, this thing may be, they may be making the show right now. I know they're making the show that they always wanted to make. And I, I frustrated them constantly, whether it was how I wanted to do the stunts, uh, how I wanted to rewrite the material. I wanted to try to bring truth to it um, and, and, and a tiny bit of integrity. And, and these guys... Definitely wanted this to be like a zing, zing, zing. Like I think Damon said, like, you know, I just want to have fun, which is the most average thing I think I've ever heard anyone, anyone say as an adult because hard, it takes, it's a lot of hard work to make a great show. It is. And again, with all the hatred or perceived hatred that you guys had for one another, um, the, the thing that I found interesting about it was I didn't look, and we, we've been friends for a long time, watching the show, it didn't show. Your, your chemistry on, on screen with Damon Wayans, I didn't know any of this shit was going on because you week in and week out, it looked like you guys were doing exactly what you wanted to do. And it was the relationship that was being portrayed. And like him hating me in real life gave him this thing of Murtaugh that I was kind of driving him crazy, which is what it was supposed to be. Riggs, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it was supposed to be that. So again, and you were going through therapy at the time and all that other shit, you were living Riggs as it was going on. Well, yeah, my wife definitely. We laugh about art imitating life and life imitating art, you know. But because, and that's both of you guys together were great, which is why I thought, me personally, you would hash it out, or the network would hash it out and say, "Hey, guys, we got a good thing going here. This thing's a fucking, get us in a room, uh, amazing, tr you know, train money train around the world. Let's keep the, this this whole shit going." Um, I find it extremely curious uh, how you continue on without Murtaugh and Riggs on lethal weapon. Look, I'm, and I'm not even here and, and, and I, I don't want to, cause I have zero feelings about network television period. And especially a show that I'm no longer a part of. I, I just don't care. I don't care what they want to do. I don't know. I, I, I hope that they, I, I like all those people, you know, Keisha and Jonathan, um, we're in my home. You know, Jonathan spent Jonathan and his wife spent Thanksgiving with me and my family. Right. You know, we were we were a family. Um, and when all this came out, they all reached out to me and out of fear of what could happen, which it's ridiculous because if we would have just all communicated honestly what was really going on, we could have continued to make this show and we could have all, you know, made our money and continue to put some, uh, you know, a quality product out there. Um, but these guys got scared. And my, my thing now is, is so many crew members have been fired. The same crew that they were protecting, m protecting, right? Why do you think that was? Ross, everybody knew what was going on, bro. I came to work every day with my kids. Not every day, but I came to work with my family a lot. 
Um, I came with a, a heart uh, full, uh, with enthusiasm, ready to try to make the best show possible because this was my big break in a lot of ways. So I, I tried to give 100%. I gave 100% every single day. Um, and the crew, we were a family, right? We worked together every day. And you don't fire. I've never in the history of you heard of you getting rid of the script supervisor, the hair and makeup team, the, the, the sound team, like just a 70 some odd crew members. And these guys are all calling me who reached out to Variety anonymously trying to give their side of the story. Because I remember, and look, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to. To me, from an outsider, not being on that set, because I, I never worked with it, but I have uh, probably four or five crew members from my movies that I've directed work on that, that set, on Lethal Weapon. To me, what they said to me privately, um, which, you know, they, I, I said, I asked them before we went on there, I said, look, can I, can I say what, what I think it is? Or what you said it was, what you think it was. And they were like, yeah, go ahead. Now at this point we can. What they said was they felt like they were choosing sides. The people who were pro Clay Crawford and the people who were, you know, anti Clay Crawford. The, the ones that were anti kept their jobs and were team Damon kept their jobs. The ones that weren't didn't. And, uh, and again, look, you don't have to answer that if you're not comfortable with it. It's but. not a matter of answering. It's not a, it has nothing to do with pro, pro Clay or pro Damon. Everyone there just wanted to make a great show. And they knew when Damon, <clears throat> when Damon went home that day because he got hit in the head with shrapnel, the producer had a poster size picture of Damon blown up that said, get well soon. And it was like a, uh, one of the stills from the art, artwork that we had had shot up for the show for season two. And they wanted the entire crew to sign it. I saw the cut on Damon's head, by the way. It was a chi- like a child, but Ross, he child size cut where it was just you've like, cut yourself worth shaving. Yeah, yeah. He it, the point is though he was blaming others when it was a fucking ricochet, and then to go around and to ask us to sign this get well card. That was the show, man. Like they just have never. I've never seen, and of course I've never worked with. That's not true. I mean, I've worked with Travolta. I've worked with Scarlett Johansson. I've worked with what you consider like an A-list star. And I've never seen anyone treat someone the way that they did him. Like they would just, they would reward his extremely poor behavior constantly, which only fueled the fire. Strange. It's, it's really, really strange. Um, so yeah, when I, we got in the car that day, man, I lost it, buddy. And, uh, and I was just really frustrated that no one was helping me. Uh, again, it was my first time directing. And I would have thought that Miller would have been right there underneath me the whole time, you know, just there to kind of support me. And, and I just thought at some point, because you got to think that day, Damon's son-in-law chest bumped me three or four times. He, Damon g- physically grabbed Miller. Cops were called. The, which was the onset security. Mm-hmm. They all have guns. They're actually police officers. They're uh, um, California Highway Patrol. They all have their motorcycles. You know this. You oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all run over and immediately grab Damon's stepson, or son-in-law, and Damon. And Damon's like, tell the men with guns to back off, Miller. Back off. And these, because these guys act, reacted immediately. I look at Miller. Damon gets in his car and speeds off. And I looked at Miller like, what the fuck are we going to do? He's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Peter Roth calls us into his office. We get in his office. And of course, I get my ass reamed. And I'm like, Miller, tell him that we just got it. Like, they physically attacked us and that they're set. Clayne, shh, you just need to listen to Peter. Just, just. I'm like, you fucking coward. You know uh, what? Fuck all of you. I don't <laughs> give a shit. What, and, I, and, and they reamed my ass. And I was just like, can I go back to work? And he's like, no. The day's done. You go home. I go home. What did they do that night? Approved all of my fucking rewrites and let me do all of the scenes. And if they would have just done that the day before, we could have avoided all of that. Right. But they continue to set me up to fail. So for whatever reason. Yeah, I was going to say, why do, why do you think that, that was? I told Kiki when I watched the first cut and it turned out really well. Your my wife, episode, by the way. Yeah, yeah. my wife. Um, I was like, that's it. She was like, what? I'm like, they hoped, they knew, they were hoping they were giving me enough rope to hang myself. And the fact that we had success, and I had success as a director, I think infuriated them. 
Look, man, I had problems with Matt Miller from the very beginning, who's the showrunner, because I had passed for a multitude of reasons. One, I just didn't want to do Network. Two, I didn't want to remake Lethal Weapon. Three, I'd heard Damon was a nightmare uh, when it came to his work ethic and that he didn't respect the craft, which I genuinely think, even if we're on fucking primetime at 7 o'clock, jumping off cars, I still looked at it as an art form, right? And I just knew that he didn't see eye to eye with that. And, and, and lastly was I just didn't think the script embodied what I had come to love as Lethal Weapon. And when I met McG, McG, that same day that I met with Peter Roth in L.A., he jumps after Peter Roth tells me about the brain tumor and that, and that Damon has a new outlook on life and all this bullshit. He throws me in a golf cart and we zoom across the Warner Brothers lot and we go over to the production, to the, uh, production offices where uh, Miller and McG are prepping. And they set me down in a room, and I was just like, ah, you know, there's just this doesn't this doesn't kind of ring true to me. And this <clears throat> Mick Jeeves, he, he's got on a cowboy hat and Jordans, right? And he's like, clean, buddy, we're gonna rewrite this, we're gonna change this. You can do whatever the fuck. He goes, you know that car chase? This seems really bullshit on the four or five. It's now in the Long Beach Grand Prix, <laughs> and you are gonna be on top of a car, car, car. <laughs> I was like, wow, that's really fucking awesome. That sounds great. Let's fucking fire it out. I was like, but Riggs kind of say, don't you worry about the dialogue. You say what you want to fucking say. I know that you're a great actor. Say what you want to say. We're going to make it work. And Miller the whole time was like, well, I don't know if we're going to say what you want to say. But, <laughs> nah, nah, nah. but you got to understand, McG had all the power at that point. Yeah. That, look, Mick G's Mick G, man. He's a powerful fucking dude. But and at that point, like you're getting a pilot made because you got Mick G directing. And I'm mm-hmm. sure Damon Wayans. Don't get me. I'm sure he having yeah. that dude because my wife and kids was a fucking huge success and it's in syndication all over the world. So I'm sure those two elements. But definitely at that point, it was it was G and and we went into. I mean, look, man, while we're shooting. I started changing so much dialogue and I would, I was changing the tone of the show because I didn't feel like there was enough emotional moments. Right. Like Miller hated that I was crying and like slid down the wall, which I know is a little, a little much, you know, dramatic when Miranda died, but me and McG had this whole kind of thing of like holding the amulet, the the necklace and like this whole deal. That's what I like though about the show that I thought it needed where you don't ever see that too much on eight o'clock primetime shows on network where it's just action shows or whatever typically you don't have those heartfelt moments or, or dramatic moments and that's what i enjoyed about lethal weapon and that's what drew me in from the pilot episode but that's what you enjoyed about the film from 1987 yes i think that's when it came out yeah and and, and even watching the pilot i remember because i fully turned it on expecting it to be a, a campy piece of shit and i watched the promo to it and you know, i remember you i remember around, you calling me i remember you calling like, me you're like you're like boy. dude you're like right before i shot right before it aired you're like I don't know how this is going to... Yeah, I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. Your career could be over. It could be, which it still could (laughs) be. It could could be. Um, But uh, when I watched it, and that, again, it was the emotion and the dramatic part of it where I was just like, oh, shit, right before it went to commercial, that I was like, all right, I'm going to give this another 15 minutes, and another 15 minutes, and and then all of a sudden, I'm at the end of the show of the pilot episode, and I'm like, holy shit, this seems different than the other... Like, uh, you know, if you watch like an NCIS or something like that, or right. it, it, like a Blue Bloods where you're like, man, I just can't buy into that shit. And Whereas, look, nothing against those guys. Not at all. But with Lethal Weapon, you had a guy who, who was Riggs who was playing dramatic moments that I really loved. Like, to me, with Mertz, I, I you guys had a great relationship. It could have been anyone. The hard job, though, is replacing Mel Gibson because he was the star of that that series and look maybe that's and maybe that's why i knew i had big shoes to fill and i think that's why i came in <clears throat> trying to again run quality control because i felt the films the success was on gibson and his good looking charm and that fucking mullet you yeah. know what i mean oh yeah and from the moment he was in that christmas tree parking lot you know trying to buy the cocaine like we were invested and I knew I had to try to create that, but I couldn't do the the zany as much because I was like, shit, I got to do 20 episodes of this a season. I can't, I have to try to find those levels, right? The ups and downs. And when we were shooting that scene at the, um, at the docks where Riggs tells Murtaugh, you've got to let me, get, I'm going to jump out. He's going to shoot and kill me, but he's going to give himself up and you shoot him. It was written that. And he goes, no. And I'm like, yes. And he goes, no. And I go, yes. And I'm like, and I go to jump out there. And I was like, oh. I was like, gee, come here, come here, come here. I was like, this seems like there should be more to this. Like I said, if we're not, 
if we don't think these two guys love each other at this point in the pilot, the pilot's not going to work. He's like, I completely agree. I was like, can I just kind of improv, just kind of run with it? And he's like, yeah, yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. He's like, all right, roll, 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 yeah, roll. Yeah. So we get behind the, it was like the gunshots and we dive behind the box and I look and I say, boom. And I, and I say, uh, I start saying to him, look, I'm going to go out there. And uh, I was like, I, I was like, look, man, I, I got a kid that I've never met. And all of a sudden, Damon's eyes started to kind of well up. I was like, I just, I've got a little boy, man, that I just want to hold. I was like, dude, I miss my girl, right? Cut, 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 cut. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on, right? And Miller, and I see an argument happening over at Video Village. And it's Miller and McG. And Miller's like, this is not the show. This is not this fucking sappy bullshit. Like, not. And I was like, guys, you hired me to come and play that. You told me I could do what I wanted to do in this character. This is how I see it. It was a huge fight. We shot it anyway. This fucking pilot screened at Warner Brothers. And that was like the number one quoted line coming out of the theaters, right? From that moment on, me and Miller were like this. He felt like I had changed his material. But yet I would walk into rooms and people would say, man, I read the Lethal Weapon script. That is not the TV show I saw. Yeah. What a great show. And I was yeah. like, and I would always say, well, it's because Miller was so kind and he would let us make alterations to the material and we would improv. And Mick G was so supportive of that. And he was, because Mick G would have me saying, fuck you, motherfucker. And just like, he's like, Cuss, I'll cut it out, I'll cut it out. Just like, he wanted me to go, right, and to find this character. And in doing that, um, I, I created a, uh, not only tension, but I kind of drew a line in the sand with me and Miller. And Miller, uh, was, and Miller was the showrunner. That's and tough. I, and that's it was tough. tough because at that moment, McGee's the most powerful guy on set. Yeah. Once McGee went home. It's you and Miller. It's me and Miller. Yeah. And, and me never being involved in network television, I was naive to that whole thing. And I could have probably paid a, played it a little better. But when I, ran into Miller, when I ran into McGee in Paris that same night that Damon apologized, Miller was like, I mean, McGee said, he was just so you know, I fought them the whole way through editing they wanted to cut all that shit out because they did cut all the stuff out about with me with a gun to my head because we shot fucking four scenes where i'm contemplating suicide and i'm putting the bullet in the chamber and they just cut 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 can't have it can't have it can't have that it, was like the it. movie man it, it, it's weird too because i look i've met matt miller uh we went to the super bowl together he's a, he's a, a you, great uh, you met him the day we all went to the absolutely nice enough guy great guy great father he brought his brought his son I got to meet his kid yep um henry yeah i i think though when you get to that level and uh you know as a producer and produce a lot of shit you hope to get to that level where you have a gigantic show on tv you play ball you play by the rules, and you play by the studio's rules, more, more importantly. Yeah. There isn't a lot of improv, first of all, or rewriting scenes. Zero. In network television at all. I mean, at all. Maybe Parks and Rec, a buddy of mine uh, worked on Parks and Rec for years and years and years. Um, maybe. Uh, the Office, even even The Office. I, I had a couple friends on The Office. and It was I said, all scripted. It, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I told them, I was like, I asked them. I said, hey, man. A lot of that seems like it's improv, and they were like, "No, no, no, no." They were like, "Maybe Steve Carell improvs here and there, but like it's all scripted, just simply because your 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 time, your budget, and your days, you have to stick by a script or your and kind ego of fucked." Yes, and ego. I think the writers, um, <clears throat> you know, they hate to have any, And look, when I worked on Rectify, you didn't change a fucking word, but you didn't dare. You were just trying to rise up to the material as, a, as, a, as an artist, like as an actor. You just wanted to make sure that you gave it the life that it deserved. With this, it's tough because they're pumping out so many episodes. And they're more focused on the crime aspect and trying to give a twist. And for me, I thought the show, just how I thought the series, uh, the film franchise, it... it it, it was all based on the relationships. It was a relationship. It was character driven. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I didn't feel like that that was there. So I was constantly rewriting and making adjustments to myself. And look, Miller was very supportive of that. Like he would let me do a complete pass and I would sit in the makeup trailer every day. And this wonderful guy, Rob would come and sit down with me. And Rob was a writer on staff and he would take all my notes and they would incorporate them. And it was a really good relationship. Um, so I thought, you know, but you know, even look coming into season two, the same dumb shit I was fighting. Like they didn't want me to wear, they were, they thought now it's time to cut the hair. Now it's time to shave. You know, they wanted me to, they wanted me to look like Sean William Scott with a tight t-shirt, skinny jeans, right. a half beard, 
and you know clean cut hair and i was like dude so Riggs wakes up every morning and puts like a number two guard on his fucking clippers and like methodically yeah, 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 like yeah, trim yeah. like what the fuck yeah. i was like either the dude shaves <laughs> and he's got a mustache yeah. or he don't like what what do we so you know again from the very beginning we didn't we didn't get along creatively none of us did um because except for the actors i think the actors all really wanted to make something great and and the same with keisha and and kevin you know this was all big for us it was yeah. huge you know so we wanted to make it the best we could yeah to me as a as a fan uh just watching the show as a you know a complete outsider again forget forget our friendship aside I enjoyed the show. I watched it with my kids. Um, it's you know on at eight o'clock. It was yeah. something that I felt safe that I could put on, have a few laughs, you know, and and get on about my day. Like, and I think a lot of people at home felt the same way. And the the outrage, boy, when you got fired on Twitter, holy shit! I don't think I've seen outrage over an actor getting fired from something like this in a very very long time. I mean. Usually it's one way or the other where it's like, oh, man, I'm team so-and-so or team so-and-so. It was all like, hey, man, you get rid of, of Clay and Crawford. You got rid of the show at that point. <clears throat> um, what's, what's that support been like from the fans since this has all happened for you? You know, what, what's funny is because I was told so often by Warner Brothers and by production that they can replace me with any goofy white guy. No one appreciated what I was doing. You know, I was, they were, they would say things like, I'm trying to steal Damon's thunder. Um, you know, all this jumping around and you're acting like Barney Fife. Um, I don't think they realized what it was I was trying to do with the character. Um, and I was, I don't know, you live in a bubble when you're on set, Ross. When you're shooting like this and you're shooting 14 hours a day, you know, five days a week. You, you don't see anyone but the people you work with. When I would leave home every morning, my kids and wife were asleep. And when I came home at night, my kids and wife were asleep. And then, you know, so when they did this to me and the fans to kind of come out and show their appreciation for the work, because it's not like I'm famous. It's not like they're supporting Clay Crawford. They're supporting Riggs, this guy that they that was in their, their houses every night, you know, every Tuesday night. Um, I can't tell you how much it's meant to me. You know, as sad as this whole process has been, um, because I kind of feel it's kind of been like going through a divorce. Yeah. It's like when you love your wife and you find out she's fucking your trainer <laughs> and then they're living in your house yeah. and he's driving your truck. Yeah. And like that's your fucking dog in the truck with him <laughs> and he's fucking your wife and like teaching your kid how to throw the baseball. Yeah. And you're living in a double wide. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so like I had that feeling of just like. That's my line. That's my that girl. My, girl. Yeah. my backyard. I was just like, oh, fuck. But outside of that, I've had to be able to go to my farm and to turn off technology and just enjoy my children and the space. And then when I do kind of go to it to see the outpour of appreciation, you know, it's look, man, it, it's, it's been somewhat it's, it's been insulating. Right. right. It, it's kind of from from a lot of the pain. So uh, super grateful. Um, I mean, the fans are who I made the show for, man, period. I don't fucking make shows for executives. I don't make shows. to make. I don't do anything to make a fucking producer happy. Those guys are bean counters. Right. I, I make a show because I want what I want when I watch a show. I want to get lost. Yeah. You know, when you we watch Guardians of the Galaxy for the first time, which is what I kind of based the show on is I was like, man, those guys found a great balance of fucking funny and dramatic. And action and entertainment. We can all do it. Yeah. We just can't take ourselves too seriously. And we got to kind of fucking fly off the cuff sometimes. Like we got to, you know, we got to be able to adjust and to be pliable. And, um, and I think we were successful with that for the first two seasons. But I, I feel like, and I'll say this, I feel like no one at Fox and no one at Warner Brothers was watching the fucking show for them to make the decision that they made. Or there's something else fucking going on, which I don't know what that could be. Right. And uh, speaking of Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, with the James Gunn situation that happened to him, uh, there was an actor that, that, that came forward, Dave Bautista, who yeah. came out and said, I'm not doing this, this series without him. I, I, I support him. I respect him, all this other shit. Um, with you, that was Hillary Burton. I remember after this whole shit went down, she wrote like a, 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 a public letter, which 
Dude, it's rare for an actor to stick their neck out like that. Jordana left the show. Jordana Brewster, so she's, she's gone, gone from the show. We're at the same management company now. Wow. Look, man, there's no confusion. Like, Andrew Greer, he's not coming back. Like, there's pe- I, I'm shocked that Kevin Rahm is back with the things that he, the, he, the text messages and how we both felt about the things that were going on on that set. I can't believe he went back. And for Keisha and her husband to act the way that they have since this all happened is just shocking. It's, it, it, it's, you know, people say you find out who, who people really are. are, And and even more than that, just who people really are, you know, when fear comes in, you know, she, I I remember Keisha just kept saying, why couldn't you apologize? Why couldn't you just apologize? Yeah. I was like, how the fuck am I, how can I suck dick and play rigs at the same time? I can't do that. Look, I'll apologize. I, I apologized to my crew that day when I freaked out and yelled at Newman. I apologized to Newman, but Newman went home. He quit that day. I can't imagine not being able to do my job and somebody reaming my ass for it and then me going home. Yeah. I just can't imagine doing that. But then again, you know, again, I'm from, I'm from a small town in Alabama. You know, I'm not, I'm not a Hollywood guy by any means. So um, it, it, it's been an unusual process and it's been unusual for my children because, you know, it, you, you don't want to think... You, you, I know that we're, we're watching the press and that we feel like that there's been a decline because it, the press is trying to keep up with social media and it's so difficult to kind of fact check. But this narrative that they've been running is 100% a lie. A lie. I never yelled at children. And Variety ran that. But what's funny, Kiki, my wife, goes to look up the article today because we're gonna, we wanted to talk about it and they've changed it to what? Clay near, yelled near, near, children, near children, yeah, yeah. not at children, yeah. but near. So it's just been, it's, it's just, it's wild. I think it's been a, it's been a learning process for my family, uh, for my children who were on set every day, who my 11 year old is able to kind of see what was going on, you know? And he's just like, Papa, how does this narrative continue to run? And it's like, buddy, it's all about clicks. Yeah. You know? And for me, I never wanted to come out and say something for two reasons. One, you just don't want to, you don't want to tell everyone in, in the world how sausage is made. I just want to put some mustard on it and buck and enjoy it, right? Don't tell me what goes into it. And, and I, I felt like that the problems we were having were internal and that they didn't need to be made public. And secondly, you know, my dad always taught me that actions speak louder than words. And I felt like the, my actions for the last two seasons sp- spoke louder than any of this negative blasphemy could have you know I, and I also I guess I I was naive to the fact that the crew I didn't know the crew had to sign an NDA so I figured when this all happened my crew would stand up and go hey I've been on set every single day I'm Tara the script supervisor and this is bullshit I thought that would happen I didn't realize that they couldn't say anything you know yeah but the good thing is Hollywood is very small it's like high school and over 70 people were fired from my crew. And now they're all on other jobs. And everyone's like, yo, what happened on Leave the Weapon? They're like, mm, not that dude. It was the other dude. Yeah. You uh, know? The first person to call me was a crew member um, who works on one of my movies. And uh, he was like, hey, man, I'm friends with your boy. And, you know, I can tell you it wasn't your boy. And I was like, ah, all right, cool. Uh, you know, I'll ask him when he gets here. Uh, lastly, b- b- you know, before we get out of here, uh, what do you hope happens in the future? And, 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 you know, are you worried about prospects of getting hired again? More importantly, look, um, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't worry about silly stuff like that. I try not to worry about the future. Uh, I try to focus on what I'm doing in the moment. I take the Nick Saban approach to life where it's all about the process and just worry about the little things. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> but, True Alabama fan. But that you know, statement. I'll say this, you know, me, the, the UPM um, who came in in season two season at the v- end of season one or the middle of season one unit production manager. Correct. Uh, Mark Albert. He wanted to get rid of his job essentially and this is not a this is not a dig by any means but his job he's a bean counter and his job is to try to turn in a show as cheap as possible yep. um that means he's doing his job successfully uh he wanted to get rid of he fired my um my weapons expert which was so crucial to the show because rock 
would go, who you know very well. Roccolati. I've, I've, I've also worked with Roccolati. Who they fired and he went to Westworld. Like that's, that's how incompetent this guy is. One of the best in is. the business, yes. And, 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 and Mark hated him. And he fired him. And they tried to fire my stunt coordinator, Tim Trella, which I fought for him. And I said, if you fire him, I'm walking off set. But his job, he wanted to get rid of everyone. And he wanted to bring in his people. And that created a riff with me and him. So, you know, look, I, I, I created a lot of enemies, man. I wanted to protect my crew uh, because everyone, you know, Warner Brothers has this whole kind of, th- and I don't know if this is with every show, but with Lethal Weapon at Warner Brothers, we, it was, it was all fear tactics. So they wanted everyone to live in fear and, um, and, and they felt like that they would get uh, better performance out of these individuals. And, and it's quite the opposite. You know, when, when you're scared, if you're going to lose your job, everyone's just walking on eggshells. Um, and, and we, we kind of went, so for me out of all this, I don't care. I know that I've worked with enough people in this industry, uh, that know who I am. And if you've worked with me, you know who I am as a human being and as a, as a man, as a father, uh, and as an artist. So I, I don't worry about that. But what I do worry about is the crew members that do not have a voice, right? And these guys, um, they don't make the kind of money that directors and producers and actors make. They're what they call below the line. Yes. Right. These guys are forced to sign NDAs. I understand signing an NDA in regards to content and keeping certain arcs and, and spoilers uh, under wraps. What is not, it, it, it's, it's inappropriate to have these individuals go through circumstances like what we've all just gone through and they're not allowed to speak out on it. So I think if anything through me doing this today is to give my crew members that all lost their jobs a voice and to say that they fired everyone who was in direct contact with actors every day. They got rid of those people. They only kept the people who would come in and set lights and even art department got fired because our department sent me two beautiful pictures at the end of season two that I hung in my dining room, right? We were, again, these are people that I considered my family. So these guys who all lost their job by doing, and they were literally doing the best job possible. I want them to have a voice and I want the public to know that they're, they're mistreated um, on a daily basis. Fuck, man. You get you get nervous saying this because you feel like you're in like an episode of Handmaid's Tale. You know, you're like, yeah. I am Clayne Crawford. It's like, shut up, shut the fuck up, shut the fuck up. It's like, no, I am. It's like, shut the fuck up. Is they're coming? They're coming. It's like, what are we all scared of? They're raping us and they're fucking taking our babies. It's like, shut the fuck up. I don't know, like, bruh. And that's how you know. I, I don't want people. People shouldn't have to work in that type of environment, man. So if anything. Um, my fans have been incredible and they have, they have, their voice has been heard and I am so thankful for that. Um, and I think the focus should be shifted to the crew. Yeah. Yeah. Do you watch the season three premiere? I'm not even going to watch fucking football on Thursday nights. Oh, come on. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's Fox. It's Fox. I won't watch. <laughs> I won't watch Fox. <laughs> For the simple fact that they made a statement that we didn't have anything to do with this. Yeah. We didn't do that. We just, we just, they told us we couldn't. I sent emails going, this shit's about to come down. We need to get in a room and we need to have a conversation. And nobody fucking returned my emails. No one called me. So, to this day, you still never got a call that you got fired. And my dad's like, dude, you should just do like the Costanza thing. Just show up to work, you know, <laughs> in, character. And, and in character. Like, hey, what's going on? Anybody got my gun? Yeah. I didn't get my sides today. Where's my, where's the truck? <laughs> <laughs> who's this new? Hey, Sean William Scott. This guy's great. Who's what are this, we doing? Who's this new guy? What are we doing? <laughs> are, are we making Murtaugh? Is he going to be captain now? Kevin, you're still here. What the fuck's happening? What are we <laughs> Where's my cheer? Oh, Clayne Crawford. It was a pleasure having you on. Um, I'm glad you got to tell your side of the story. Uh, look, not only do I love you as a person, but I love you as an actor. And like, shit, I, I was sad to see this happen on this show. And, um, you know, lastly, I, I will say this. I've met Sean William Scott on a few occasions. I hear he's the nicest guy in the world. Great guy. And uh, he's stepping into... Uh, 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 and and I wonder what he was told and what he was sold. Yeah, you know. And and I just and I want to say one other thing again about media. 
the media ran tweets from Damon that came at 3 a.m. as headlines. Not one of them was true. Not one fucking thing that he said was true. The green tea bottle was in a scene and the poor actor missed it. And yeah. I was the one that came up with the idea, let's take the fucking liquid out so the poor guy can have a chance. Like, Not only that, but the actor said nothing. Like He, he was look, just like, dude, look, it was an Look, look, I don't make like, girls cry. Yeah. Chandler worked with me in my episode the, the majority of the time in episode 20. And I mean, her and I had a great time. It was just, every, it was a bunch of fucking lies. And the fact that the media doesn't give a shit and they just run it. And now these motherfuckers are running my picture yeah. and my name just to try to get more clicks. Scandalous, bro. Crazy. Man. Crazy. Man. Well, look, I, I, I can't wait to see what your new projects are, what you'll be in. Look, I know everybody's I might just be hanging out, out here. Yeah. And just start cutting azaleas. Why and, not? Yeah. Uh, join, join the fucking show. Join the bring. I don't know, but I could pressure wash your driveway for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this is really my thing, but I could really do some good hard labor out here for you. <laughs> <laughs> Spruce the space up. Uh, thanks for thanks for stopping by. Thanks for coming to Wilmington, North Carolina. Love you, buddy. Thanks, buddy. Uh-huh.